Hi, I'm Dr. D. Hi, I'm Princess Gaia. Hi, I'm Dr. B. <laughs> we are so fortunate today to host uh, Dr. Larry Bonds as our guest, and he's going to give his presentation, Louisiana Salt Marsh Stories. I'm an uh, English professor at McMurray University where I work with Dr. D, a friendship I value greatly. And I earned my PhD at Texas A&M in College Station. Uh, for my PhD, I worked on deer hunting in Shakespeare. Uh, my personal background is that I was born in Texas and my family moved when I was a child to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where I became acquainted with Louisiana's culture, which is different from the culture of much of the rest of the United States. And growing up in Baton Rouge, uh, I got my first exposure to the salt marshes of uh, deep southern Louisiana. And much of my childhood was spent scouting. I was out in the woods and marshes and other places all the time. And I'm very interested in the outdoors and in wildlife and, and in ecology. My father is an avid fisherman. He grew up fishing in Arkansas, a state that borders both Louisiana and Texas. Dad and his brothers and father would go fishing to try to get fish for the table. So dad developed a real, you know, a, a great enjoyment in fishing as a child after he graduated while uh, my mom was teaching uh, biology in a little South Texas town. He got a, his engineering degree and then started working as an electrical engineer. And in Baton Rouge then he started taking up fishing. Uh, fast forward about 10 years from that time, 15 years from that time, he set up his own company and that gave him the income then to begin pursuing fishing in salt waters, especially the Louisiana salt marsh. I had already been going to some of the salt marsh areas when I was in Boy Scouts, but when my father uh, got more money, he started going down in this area southwest of New Orleans, and he fell in love with salt marsh, and then I started going down and fishing with him in that marsh, and that's how I became acquainted with it. You know, probably for, I don't know, 30 or 40 years of my life, I've been in and around and, and near that salt marsh down there, and so that's how I came to this area study. So my title is Alligators, American Eagles, Erosion, and Brown Pelicans. Salt marsh wetlands are valuable, and uh, the Louisiana salt marsh, you know, is the, it's this huge breeding ground for salt marshes are these places where the ocean begins to meet lowlands and uh, there's a combination of freshwater and salt water, but uh, they are extraordinarily valuable and important to us. Uh, salt marshes provide breeding habitat for commercial, uh, for commercially valuable seafood species. They act as buffer zones that help mitigate the damage that hurricanes do to dense inland human populations, which is something I'm very concerned with since I grew up in Louisiana. The Mississippi has been changed essentially a gate keeps the Mississippi from going in and inundating New Orleans. That was built uh, to help control the Mississippi during times of flood by the U.S. Corps, uh, Army Corps of Engineers. And when uh, Hurricane Katrina struck, it actually did not do very much damage to New Orleans, uh, but what it did was it brought inland a whole bunch of uh, uh, a big uh, surge of water. And after the hurricane had actually passed, that surge came and it started topping the levees to Lake Pontchartrain and topping uh, the Mr. Go. Uh, and so New Orleans, especially the parts that uh, were outside of the relatively elevated area of the French Quarter, became overwhelmed with water and New Orleans was going underwater.
if the salt marshes had been uh, saved and if humans had not done so much taming or channeling rather of the Mississippi, that destruction of New Orleans wouldn't have happened uh, as it did. So I guess one of the big themes that I'm trying to make in my area here is that human interaction is a huge part of the way we're treating this ecosystem. And sometimes human interaction, even when it's well intended, can have really bad consequences. Salt marshes furnish a great deal of commercially valuable seafood and employment and salt marshes supply innumerable recreational opportunities for people who are increasingly alienated from nature, who are alienated from Gaia, you know, from, from the, the world we live in. But if we learn lessons from that interaction, perhaps we can take steps uh, to save the salt marsh. One of the things that I wanted to talk about was the story of the alligator. Uh, an animal that lives on land and in the water, uh, you know, and so it's, you know, amphibious and uh, lives in both environments. It's another example of human interaction with nature that was going very badly and it became much better. And there's a picture, nice big picture of an alligator. That's a big one. That one's probably, uh, that's about six to, uh, I'm sorry, that's about two to uh, three meters long. You know, that's a, that's a very hefty size. And they used to be very common in Louisiana. Alligators are apex predators. That is, you know, and they kill uh, and take a great many uh, wildlife species. They don't usually attack humans in Louisiana. Uh, there have been several attacks uh, from them uh, or by them in, uh, South Carolina and Florida. And unregulated hunting brought the alligator to the brink of extinction in the wild. And although I was frequently in the wild, in the outdoors for long periods of time when I was a child, uh, especially when I'd go camping uh, once a month or so as a Boy Scout, I didn't see an alligator in the wild until I was 16. You know, I'd been in scouts for years before I actually saw one. Uh, because they had become so rare. And that alligator appeared for just a few seconds, about 100 meters away from me. Uh, I was in my canoe on a, the Wiscachetta River, uh, which is a tributary, tributary of the Calcasieu River in western Louisiana. And the year of unrestricted hunting and trapping of the alligators, that lasted until 1962. Uh, and people realized that we were going to exterminate them if we kept out what we were doing. And over hunting in the days of no hunting and trapping regulations for alligators, especially in the 1950s, severely threatened Louisiana and all of the Deep South's uh, alligator populations. Uh, demand for alligator hides was making fashion, it fashion items such as shoes, belts, wallets, and purses. Uh, that was driving the overhunting. And alligator also provides an edible and tasty meat that uh, resembles somewhat chewy chicken in texture and flavor. You know, every, of course, everything tastes like chicken, but uh, in a great many Louisiana restaurants, one can get alligator. Nowadays, alligators have really recovered. Limited alligator hunting began, became legal in 1972, so 10 years after the dam. Uh, it's now common to see alligators in the wilds of Louisiana and other Southern American states. I regularly see alligators on the salt marshes that I love to fish. This, of course, is unscientific evidence that many animals are surviving to reproductive adulthood. And that's good, you know. Apex predators like alligators are good for the ecosystems in which they live. According to uh, the Wildlife and Fisheries Department of Louisiana, Alligator hunters uh, now legally take 35,000 animals per year. I have a story about my daughter and alligators. My daughter, uh, Katie, and the alligator in the bayou. When my daughter Katie was about seven, my family and I went to my father's fishing camp in the salt marsh near Chauvin, Louisiana. And one afternoon, I was cleaning some fish on the shore end of my father's dock. And some teens, even a few hundred meters up the bayou, were 
jumping into the water from an ele elevated deck built on the dock. The deck rose about four meters above the surface of the water. So these teenagers are there busy swimming and splashing and making all kinds of noise, you know, in the bayou and the, this river where this, uh, you know, fairly large alligator is busy, you know, is swimming around just a, you know, just a short distance away. The alligator looked like a floating log, except that now and then it would uh, swish its tail to move against the current of the bayou. I pointed the alligator out to Katie and she pulled her feet out of the water at the speed of light. I guess it's probably funnier for me as her father, but uh, it's one of those uh, one of those stories that uh, I enjoy about uh, that time. As I finished my work, I saw the alligator swim slowly up and down the bayou, and perhaps it was waiting to come feed on the fish parts that I was throwing into the bayou. Uh, you know, that sort of stuff does not, you know, is not does not go to waste. In other words, in the bayou. You know, the uh, seagulls and pelicans will come feed on those fish parts. And near the area of my father's camp, there are um, otters who live. And they will come and get fish parts. Uh, and if we're not very careful about wiring a bait bucket that holds minnows down below the bayou, the otter will come and figure out how to take the wire off and then help himself to the uh, to the minnows that we uh, sometimes use as bait. They're funny. Lessons from the survival of the alligator. Human activity drove the wild alligator to the brink of extinction, but human activity, human choices and activity brought the alligator back so that this apex predator is coexisting with humans and doing what predators do that is good for wildlife populations. Uh, those apex predators, they call the weak, the aged, and diseased animals from the population. Uh, they take some younger and healthy ones too, but they really, they're really good for the other wildlife, so it's great to have them back. When human choices can make it possible, wise rather, human choices can make it possible to save other uh, parts or other aspects of the salt marsh ecosystem. Solving other dangers to the salt marsh ecosystem if we had more time. The American bald eagle has returned to the salt marshes because humans chose to ban DDT. And one of the animals that had disappeared from the salt marshes and from Louisiana is the brown pelican. Uh, it's uh, featured on the Louisiana state seal and flag, and it was extinct in the wilds of Louisiana by 1963. I lived in Louisiana uh, starting in the spring of 1968. And uh, I think by the time I was on Scouts, I believe there were 17 breeding pairs in the wild that had been you know, captured in other parts of brown pelican habitat uh, and released. And nowadays it's, it's regular, you know, it's common to see those pelicans. Uh, when the U.S. banned DDT as a poison, which was used, you know, with a good human goal of, you know, controlling mosquitoes and bed bugs, in other insect populations, brown pelicans and bald eagles began to recover. And it's now common to see huge flocks of brown pelicans in the wilds of Louisiana. When I was a, a young teen and in scouts, uh, the wild population of brown pelicans in Louisiana was, I think, 17 breeding pairs is the figure I remember. Nowadays, I can see a flock at a single time that will have 30 or 50 or even 100 brown pelicans in it. It's really wonderful. Other dangers to the salt marsh ecosystem, if we had more time. I see at least three human threats to the salt marshes. Oil and gas exploration. Obviously, you, everybody will have heard about the deep water horizon and its explosion. It happens uh, maybe 150 kilometers out at sea and oil from that came into the salt marsh that I really love and covered the, the plants and the animals. Uh, it also, uh, oil exploration involves cutting and dredging in the marshes to facilitate petroleum exploration. Those same canals and dredging also make it possible for humans to go in to those marshes for recreational uh, uh, purposes. And so there's a, you know, there's a real mix of positive and negative effects that go on 
with that exploration. Climate change, obviously, and rising levels of the ocean threaten those marshes. You know, so much of uh, our inhabitable land and, you know, the rising levels of the ocean will destroy that salt marsh ecosystem. Uh, alteration of natural drain, water drainage systems so that the water doesn't move slowly through the marshes is one of the biggest problems with what we uh, need for the marshes to have. Rapid water movement is eroding lands in the marsh and converting the salt marshes into open water. And it's get, getting rid of this wonderful, uh, wonderfully rich place for breeding uh, the, uh, the, the animals that we need as part of our lives. If you were to speak to a young person, like a student in particular, what message would you have for them based on this story? I would say, I would say that it's, it's urgent that we begin acting to correct human mistakes. Uh, we had the power to have a really strongly negative impact on these marshes, but we also have the power to begin changing our behaviors so that we can preserve this part of our world. And, you know, and this part of our world is extraordinarily precious and valuable. We need to stay, we need to save it. I also, some personally doing, I mean, how are you changing your behavior? Oh, my goodness. Yes, how, yes. Well, one thing I, you know, I do is, you know, I, uh, my father and I, we, we scrupulously observe uh, catch limits for the fishes, you know, the fish that we take. We're very careful that we do not put any trash in the water. Uh, and that's, that's different, you know, I confession about my father. I love my father deeply. Uh, but when I was a kid in Louisiana, we would do our own oil changes on cars. And the way dad would dispose of the oil uh, and get me as his accomplice is I would take the dirty oil and just pour it in the storm sewer in front of the house, which is awful. I mean, just awful. You know, uh, that oil can be recycled. And so, I mean, I, I don't change my own oil anymore. That's one of the biggest changes in my own behavior. My father now recognizes just how bad that was, what we were doing. When I used to raise the question when I was a child, I'd say, isn't this really bad for all the groundwater around here? Uh, he's like, nah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, <laughs> most of the boats that people use, uh, gasoline powered motors, and they put a great deal of pollution into the marsh. You know, there's uh, no good reason for people not to use human power for a great deal of their interaction uh, with the marshes. The Cajuns, les Acadiens, they have a uh, watercraft called the Piro. And the Piro is a, uh, the original Piros were uh, cypress trees, uh, cypress logs that had been hollowed out in shapes. They're, they're really wonderful pieces of craft art. And those piros are really wonderful for navigating shallow marsh waters. I would like to see a resurgence of the piro in people using the marshes. We need to have science of creating ways of slowing the water back down so that it drops soil and nutrients into the salt marshes. Uh, the marshes are a dynamic living place and they exist because water traditionally was very moving very slowly through those areas and dropping soil. Now a whole bunch of that soil is shot out into the middle of the Gulf of Mexico 